Occults, and you are listening to Looking Up with Don. This is the Looking Up with Don podcast, episode number 79, for the week of July 7th, 2021. The related website for this podcast is donmacholtz.com. That is spelled D-O-N-M-A-C-H-H-O-L-Z dot com. Two H's. What's up in the sky this week? As our week begins on Wednesday, July 7th, the moon is a slim crescent in the morning eastern sky. The moon will be new on Saturday, July 10th at 0616 Universal Time, meaning for some of you, the moon will be new on July 9th and for some on July 10th. The moon passes north of the sun. On Thursday, July 8th, the moon passes by Mercury. This is only 20 degrees from the sun in the morning sky. Now, for those wanting to see the very thin crescent moon, the northern hemisphere is favored as the moon is north of the ecliptic. Try to see it on the mornings of July 8th and 9th. And try seeing the crescent moon in your western sky on the evenings of Saturday, July 10th and Sunday, July 11th. On Sunday, July 11th and Monday, July 12th, the moon passes by both Venus and Mars. By next Tuesday, July 13th, the moon will be a slim crescent in our evening sky. Speaking of Venus and Mars, they will be close to each other early next week. They will be at their closest about a half a degree apart on Monday, July 12th at about 0700 hours universal time. For many of those in the Western Hemisphere, the evening of July 11th will show the closest approach. Venus is the bright one, magnitude minus 3.9, and 1.4 times farther from us than is the Sun. Mars will be south of Venus and much fainter, magnitude 1.8. It's 2.5 times farther from us than is the Sun. Both objects will appear small in a telescope. Venus is 12 arc seconds across. Mars is one third of that. Will you be able to see the International Space Station this week, which for our purposes begins Wednesday, July 7th through Tuesday, July 13th? This week we have six zones. All you need to know is your latitude. North of 62 degrees north, you will not see the International Space Station at all. From 57 through 62 degrees north, the ISS will be in your morning sky for almost the whole week. From 35 degrees north to 57 degrees north, the ISS will be in your morning sky for the whole week and also in your evening sky for most of the week. Some of you will be able to see it three times in one night. From 24 through 35 degrees north, only during the end of the week can you see it, and then it will be in both your morning and evening sky. From 30 degrees south to 24 degrees north, the equatorial zone, you can see the ISS in your evening sky for at least part of the week. Those in the Northern Hemisphere can see it for only the last few days of the week. Those in the Southern Hemisphere can see it for almost the whole week. Further south, from 55 through 30 degrees south, the ISS will be in your evening sky for at least most of the week. To determine where it will be in your sky, go to the website heavens-above.com and enter your location then click on ISS. The Hubble Space Telescope has been having some computer problems over the past few weeks. 
The team is working on it, trying to get the backup units online. This Thursday, June 10th, I'll be giving a Zoom lecture to the Stockton Astronomical Society about visual comet hunting and about my own comet hunting. Stockton, California has an active and exciting club with interesting meetings, public and private star parties, and even a telescope-making workshop. And they have a great newsletter. Through the decades, I've given several talks to the Stockton group in person. This one is on Zoom, and you can go to their website, Stockton Astronomical Society, and get a link to the meeting. That will be this Thursday, July 8th at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Periodic Comet 15P Finlay is still in our morning sky at about magnitude 10 or 11. It will be closest to the sun this week at 0.99 astronomical units. Comet 15P Finlay is plotted on Podcast 78 Map 4 with dash marks for zero hours universal time. If you want the positions, right ascension and declination, they are listed on Podcast 78 Comet Positions. You can also go to the website heavens-above.com and click on Comets to find where it is at that exact moment. Now for the astral class. Light comes in many wavelengths, frequencies, and colors. We humans and most animals see in what is known as the visible range. This is a narrow range of all the light in the universe. There is more to astronomy than meets the eye. We see from purple, which is a short wavelength, to red, which is our long wavelength. Green and yellow are near the middle. What is beyond purple at the shorter wavelengths? It is ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays. We cannot see these wavelengths. How about in the other direction? What is beyond red and the longer wavelengths? That's where we find infrared light, Wi-Fi waves, radio and TV waves. We cannot see those waves neither, but we can detect them with radio telescopes. Radio astronomy began rather accidentally when Carl Jansky in 1932 noticed he kept getting this hissing noise from his transatlantic shortwave voice transmissions. What's all that static on the radio? Since the signals occurred roughly every 24 hours, he at first thought it was the sun. But a more thorough study showed the static repeated every 23 hours, 56 minutes. This meant it was outside our solar system, and it was coming from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Radio astronomy was born. Radio telescopes are large and use mesh or metal panels to reflect the radio waves to the center sensor. They can be tens of meters across. In fact, radio telescopes operate both day and night and even in cloudy weather. They just don't do too well during thunderstorms. In the early days, the resolution of these radio telescopes was not very good. Resolution depends upon the size of the aperture and the wavelength of the light. Even with large apertures, those big dishes, the accuracy would be only within a degree or two. Then, using a light phenomenon known as interferometry, astronomers have learned how to use several dishes separated by wide distances to increase the resolution. Now they can easily and accurately pinpoint objects in the sky. Radio telescopes can see things that we cannot see, such as clouds of gas. 
Both the Sun and Jupiter create radio waves, which astronomers study. Astronomers also use radar for close objects within our solar system. By sending out radio waves and hearing the echo when, when they bounce back, astronomers can determine the shape of an object. This has been used for asteroids passing near the Earth. It can also be used to count meteors even in daylight. Can you build a radio telescope and listen to the sky? Yes, you can. I've always been interested in this, but have never gone about building my own radio telescope. But it can be done. Next week, I'll discuss stars. Let's look at three more globular star clusters in our evening sky this week. Last week, we looked at M10 and M12 in Ophiuchus. This week, we will stay in the same constellation and see three more globular clusters. All three are plotted on Podcast 79, Map 3. And all three should be visible in binoculars under good conditions. For globular clusters, I've learned that large aperture greatly improves the view. Moderate magnification helps, too. For much of my comet hunting, I've used smaller aperture instruments, a 4.25-inch 10-centimeter reflector, a 10-inch 25-centimeter reflector, and 5.3 inches, 13 centimeter homemade binoculars. Globular clusters did not show much detail with those instruments. I now use an 18.5 inch, that's a 47 centimeter reflector, and the globulars show much more detail than in the smaller scope and under lower magnification. We begin with M14. It is magnitude 7.7 .7 and measures 8 arc minutes in diameter. It sits 33,000 light years away, and it's about 100 light years across. It was observed by Charles Messe in 1764. Now, M14 under low power, it seems to sit in the middle of nowhere. Increase the magnification and look for details in the outer areas, as some stars should easily resolve. Look then at the core, and notice the stars are not uniformly distributed across this cluster. There seems to be some spaces between the stars as one looks toward the center. Our next object is M9. It is magnitude 7.3 and only 4 arc minutes in size. It sits 22,000 light years from us, about two thirds the distance as M14. Now, M9 might be a letdown after seeing M14. This cluster is obscured by dust and gas between us and it. If not for that, it would appear brighter and bigger. Even with high magnification, this cluster is difficult to resolve. Note that it does not appear perfectly round. Nearby is globular cluster NGC 6356. It is only about four-tenths of a magnitude fainter than M9. While comet hunting, I pick up M9 and, and this globular cluster 6356, and also usually 6342, a magnitude fainter and south of M9. I've often wondered, on May 29th, 1764, when Charles Messe observed M9, he missed 6356. It appears a cutoff for, for visibility of globular clusters in this area for Messier lies somewhere between these two clusters. One was bright enough to be seen. The other was too faint to be seen. What do you think? Next, we observe M107. It is magnitude 8.6, a magnitude fainter than our first two clusters. It's about five arc minutes in size, 
and rather close to us for a globular cluster, 19,000 light years. We have no notes from Charles Messier about M107. It was included in his catalog later. Messier's assistant, Pierre Machian, observed it and mentioned it. Apparently, Messier also observed it, but did not place it into the catalog himself. M107, like M9, suffers from being obscured by gas and dust from our galaxy. It does not seem to be round, but elongated east-west. The core of M107 seems loose with outlying strings of stars going in several directions. It can be partly resolved. So there you have it. Three globular clusters for your observing pleasure this week. Get out and see them. To recap the podcast, what's up this coming week? Watch the western sky these evenings. Venus will be closing in on Mars all week. On Sunday and Monday, they will be within a half a degree of each other. And they'll be joined by the moon. This is a good photo opportunity. Comet Finlay is in our morning sky, which is now free of the moon. And get out and see M14, M9, and M107. You have been listening to Looking Up with Don, podcast episode number 79 for July 7th, 2021. I'm Don Mockles. Once again, the related website for this podcast is donmockholtz.com. That is spelled D-O-N-M-A-C-H-H-O-L-Z dot com. Two H's. That's where you get the podcast handouts from my website. You can contact me at dontheastronomer at gmail.com. Once again, that is Don the astronomer at gmail.com God willing and pod willing I'll be back next week for another episode of Looking Up with Don We will discuss what's up in the sky We'll look at something on the moon and I'll talk about stars All that and more Thank you for listening See the sky this week I'll see you next week.